uh, joining us now to help us break it down is Randy Gibbons, a Jeffrey Senior Shipping Analyst. Uh, Randy, we'll get to the implications of shipping in a second, but what do you expect in terms of inventory build at 11? What sort of a dislocation effect from Hurricane Laura, and what sort of a demand issue that we have to contend with? Hey, yeah, great, uh, great talking with you, Alex. So what we saw from Hurricane Laura about two weeks ago, right, you had 84% of Gulf of Mexico production offline. Now, since then, it's gone back up to only around 14% of that production being offline. So you're starting to see production come back pretty quickly. Fortunately, Laura was not as, you know, damaging as a lot of people expected. So you are seeing the U.S. offshore production coming back on pretty quickly. Onshore wasn't really changed as much. Now, we do expect continued kind of drawdowns and depletion um, from the inventory levels as well in the next couple weeks here because, right, demand is not rebounding as quickly as many people thought it was, right? Refinery utilization is still in the mid-70s, uh, not at 80, not at 85 percent, right, mm -hmm. what it was uh, just a few months ago. So we expect continued drawdowns from the inventory. These exports are still pretty strong. Production is not. As a result, you need to draw down the inventories further. All right, so we have been seeing um, leasing for vessel uh, storage for oil. That's sort of cropping up uh, all over as hotspots flare up for the virus as well. Is that like a purely we've seen freight rates decline, or are we in another super contango situation that we were in uh, earlier in the year where there's just no demand, too much supply, oil sits on the water, full stop? Sure. Certainly not the, the term super contango yet, right? Back in April, that was the word of the, the day, right? You had about a $14 spread uh, over 12 months and around 8 or $9 just over six months. So the prompt prices were so far below six, 12 months later that every vessel that could become available was available and storing oil. Now that contango has blown out a little bit, you know, it's, it's the largest it's been since probably late May. Uh, but it's still only around three dollars for six months, you know, compared to like I said, eight or nine dollars just a few months ago. So you are seeing some contango floating storage plays. For example, Trafigura, they booked four to six uh, vessels in the last week to do just that. Right now, they don't say we're going to float this uh, this oil off the coast of Singapore. Right? They don't exactly tell you what you're what they're, what they're doing. But when you know that they charter a vessel for six months, they're buying it now, selling it later, and just using that time spread to collect on the profit. I just want to um, hold that thought for just a moment if I can, Randy. Randy, uh, let's come back to you right now. I hear that there's a lot of crude leaving Saudi right now. It's not going to the U.S. Where's it going? And do you expect the Saudis to keep pumping at the kind of rates that they are? Yep, it's starting to come out in full force, especially heading to Asia, right? It's the shortest route. If you could take a barrel from Saudi to China versus the U.S. to China, uh, you'd much rather from Saudi because it's so much closer. That said, you know, Saudi Arabia, they're starting to pull back those production cuts uh, that they announced back in April. So now they're down to 7.7 .7 for all of OPEC plus, 7.7 .7 million barrels a day. Uh, so they continue to trim that, right? So production is continuing to rise. Exports are starting to pick up. Now, the big thing is, is China demand there, and is it enough to satisfy these incremental barrels? In our view, not yet. As a result, you're seeing Brent now back right around 40, if not below, uh, as we speak. Um, and there's going to be probably continued softness on that until you really see that ramp up in the Asian demand to buy these Saudi barrels without needing much of a price disconnect. Uh, who wins here? I mean, you, you, you cover the shipping industry, right? So yeah. what are the stocks that are going to benefit? Yeah, when it comes to contango and floating storage, you want VLCCs. That's a very large crude carrier that holds 2 million barrels of crude, right? So the two companies that we like the best in this environment are Euronav, ticker EURN. They're the largest tanker fleet in the world, $2 billion market cap. Uh, they have the most VLCCs, right? Great management team. The other one we like is International Seaways, INSW, right? And you can't spell wins without INSW. And when it comes to VLCCs with spot exposure, the best balance sheet in the industry, and the shares trading at a massive discount to NAV, all INSW does is win, win, win. So that, those are the top two picks on the tanker trade that we like here for the next at least four to five months. And I'll give one more quick note. Every year, or at least 18 of the last 20 years, VLCC rates bottomed in late August, early September. So that's where we are today. And pretty much in 18 of those 20 years, you saw a marketed pickup in the next three to four months. So from now until year end. So this is a great time to play the tankers, especially Euronav and International Seaways. Couldn't leave it there.
Randy, always appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Randy Gibbons of Jeffrey's updating us on what is happening in the tanker space.